The hunter's shadows sprung limbs and face as they got close enough to distinguish their frozen breaths from Sangar's own. Sangar quivers, her uncle Arek stated, kicking snow over the hissing coals. Arek had long braided red hair that he tucked into his bearskin coat. Unlike Jor, Arek kept no beard, and he wore the short stature of a northerner. His face smooth and square like a boar's snoot, the restlessness in his orange eyes easily mistakable for excitement. Aye, her father agreed. Best be wary. Do the shepherds bid ill? Wraith asked. They bid quiet, unusual quiet, Jor grumbles. No sign of the red eyes but the quiet, no time to waste light. Jor took the first step with a firm plant of his walking stick. His invitation for the rest of them to join in following his old tracks towards the river. Arek gave Jor a loving jab before following in his footsteps. Kamut followed Arek, and Wraith followed Kamut, a chain link of sashes and clasped hands. She cast her attention to the blue-gray sheen of the frozen river Tyrannus ahead. Tyrannus collapsed into haze, so wide her opposed shore lay out of reach beyond the veil. Jor put Tyrannus over their left shoulders, anchoring them to the gash that struck across the body of the forest, and setting themselves on the surest path back that didn't take them by fish line. A good way to get ambushed. Tyrannus, like the breath, guarded those who lived along its northern shores. Jor had brought them from beyond, but she had as much a recollection of it as she had sight of the distant shore and only the tattered tales of the village folk to go by. Forcing a crossing was a kumquat's errand, but not unheard of. Crossing meant braving the breath without footsteps to follow, trees to grasp, or wits to guide you. She could walk and walk until she froze, or maybe find it took only a dozen steps to cross shore to shore. P, you trying to scare us? Jor called back from point, all three of them waiting at the edge of obscurity, nearly consumed by the breath while she stood firm upon the river's edge. Comet's strong hand had let her slip. So much for that being a treat. Ray, Arek scolded, catching her facing homewards. There be nothing that away but dogs and men who fuck dogs. Forget it and keep pace. To travel the senseless plain was the domain of the Malvas Nor's astrologues, and only they alone, for they were the masters of those southern lands, and they took poorly to outsiders. Dogfuckers, he'd said, and Wraith spit. She'd heard no stories of clever fish folk who'd built an empire in the worm spine. Some day she'd see the summer palace, the hanging gardens, and Jade Lake. The first orange smears bled through the gray. Campfires burning near the outer tents took shape ahead along with her relief. The freeze at least brought with it a muting of the village's fishy stink. But even still its pungent traces still wafted over her, twisting her stomach and ending her fledgling hunger. Twind spiraled out from a central source. A tight patchwork of taper-topped hide tents strewn around a ruin of overgrown brick emanating out until it encountered the iced gully of Turnus in the south, the empty distance of the north, and the rocky crags in the west and east. Although during the freeze, Tyrannus did not flow and the fish stayed downriver. Caribou hides from Urukin in the east, and sculpted claw from the hupes in the west, still flowed in and out readily assuming that when Tyrannus had flowed in the summer, its bounty kept the village fed and plump. The face of the village changed with the seasons. Entire families came and went as often as traders. Many chased marriages or game. Many came fleeing neshers or marauders. Many decided they'd rather be hupe than twish or twish rather than hupe. Like their river, these folks were an inconstant people. Prosperity's attraction drew in many the twish deemed unworthy, and were pushed out to live on the fringes. Though Wraith didn't mind the peace and quiet that came with being an outsider. If enough people came in a season, they might band together in smaller settlements, whose lifespans measured in seasons. Only two villages, Quatan and Futin Kir, stood the test of time, and in time were welcomed among the loved of the fish people as well. She and her family had not yet been afforded that honor. The fruits of a verdant summer lay piled atop colorful rugs and dog-drawn sleds. Salted venison, ice blocks, clay pots, wicker baskets, 
rare gems, spiritual incenses, and every manner of fur changed hands for fish, game, and crafts. A traveler, tattooed with many antlers, rocked over a display of glassy green stone flecks upon a purple rug. Green moss rock piercings in his nose, cheeks, and ears proudly declared his ancestry. He was of Lull, a confederate of Malvus Nor further up the shore. Arek and Kamut kept on. They had nothing to show for the day's hunt, so they had nothing to trade and thus went their way, after bidding farewell. "'You've need of the holy moss?' the trader asked. Her father knelt into the snow in answer. Her father put forth a sack, drawing the string and spilling the quail she'd shot. "'Quail from near out Dagger Rock. Good eaten. Feathers are good for fletching. "'Or you can decorate them,' Wraith added. "'The fishing women like the golden ones from the cocks. They make good fans and bustles. P, Jor said, untying the rabbit and lifting it at her for her to take. Evren needs care. She looked at the rabbit, then at the traveler from Malvis Nor. This'll be quick, look. She sat beside her father, legs tucked beneath her, knees against the snow. Moss this clean is rare this freeze, Nesher's at the roots, ate him down to the stumps. The lol's sunburst eyes swept over her from head to knees. She drew her arms close in a fence of her own. But as his eyes went, she realized he wasn't interested in her, but rather the things she carried. Her hatchet, her bow, her arrows, her waterskin, and coonskin boots. He reached for the glass axe at her belt. Her father slapped him away with the back of his hands. Sniff and piss, are ya? These are the scraps the shapers and the speaker didn't want. They ain't clear, they ain't smooth, they ain't even pure. Ten for the bird, and another two for that lookin' and ookin' ye did. Jor then reached for the shards. The Malva's lull man stiffened, and this thrust out the bony backs of his hands again. Her father would have none of it. He reached forward, turned one of the trader's hand over, and pushed the quail into it. Twelve, Jor stated and mimicked the gesture, exposing his gloved palms and accepting the deal. The trader stared at Yor, who met the expression in turn. Then they both began to laugh. Ha! Ah, I did not recognize a brother without moss. The trader motioned to the rows of piercings in his cheeks and ears. You've gall like these rivermen lack. I'm Jor Vakta, her father said if it were all, then added, Breaker of Gutfang. Breaker of Gutfang? The trader sat upright, showing his interest. A boast of songs. Ha! Huh, the Vakdern blood rider among fish folk? Sangar must know laughter after all. Wraith fingered the snow as she listened. Vakderna? Blood rider? Breaker of Gutfang? Guftang, she guessed, must be a Nesher. She knew much about her mother's and uncle's people, the Yelts of Yellow Lake. But of Malvus Nor? She knew little beyond their knots and tools, and that they fucked dogs, she supposed. What's that mean? Break at a gut fang? She asked. Oh, a boast worthy of Malvus himself, the trader said. The reverence surprised Wraith, and the look she gave Jor she hoped would force an explanation. Her father only grunted and continued to gather the moss rock. A boast is a boast, but you know me name. Give yours. Quetkanth. Kanth, her father said. Small clan? Small, but rising. Quet said. War chief Koja rises. Things are changing, Jorvakta. The shepherds know. The chieftains know. Know what? Shish's ladies sing. A good thaw comes. A thorn crown grows. The shepherds hide. They know Malvus has returned. Lost, Wraith awaited her father's explanation. She'd poked and prodded for freeze or thaw to get Jor to tell her of his people. Arek, as readily as he spoke of the Malvas with spite, knew nothing worth sharing. P, Jor stated, his tone firm. Wraith clutched her deerskin clothes. Go home and cook for your brother. Jor wrapped the moss rock shards into a sack with the rabbit and set it on her lap. I want to speak with Quet for a time. Can I stay too? I want to... Your brother is waiting and ill. Her back talk plucked plucked his impatience and he hit the grass beneath the snow. Disappointing, she brushed the snow from her knees as she stood. Wanted to meet you, Quet. The old trader smiled back at her. Shepherds avert their gaze, Wraithvakta. 
Honored be a daughter of such a great warrior. And home she set to tend another, her brother Evron wilted and ill. <laughs> 